today is Tuesday, uh, June 20th, 2023, and this is the City of Iowa City's work session. The first item on our agenda is review urban chicken regulations. And I know that this was one that Councilor Dunn uh, submitted, but we also had some staff correspondence. So um, whoever wants to just jump in. Staff can go first. Um. I'll, I'll yield to you. I'll go to me. Okay, sure. Uh, so uh, this item has particularly come up a couple times over the past couple years, uh, as I understand, but came to my attention uh, more recently through a couple of conversations that I had. One uh, particular um, email that we all received from a resident named Jason Agney about a little uh, book report, or not really a book report, a little letter to the community, a letter to the city council advocating for us to uh, unban roosters. So this is part of me making good on a promise to, to try. Um, at the same time, I, I was also in a conversation with a few residents at Prairie Hill, uh, and I am aware of other residents at other, uh, you know, co-housing, co-op um, organizations in the community uh, that want to have legal roosters, want to go through, not, pardon me, not roosters, chickens, uh, and want to go through the legal uh, process to do it, but because of our um, ban on uh, urban chickens in multifamily residential homes, uh, they are prohibited from doing so. So uh, this uh, started with a few ideas that I sent off to staff, a um, couple different proposals, one looking uh, at the you know, possibility of uh, allowing roosters in the community to be discussed and decided by council, uh, as well as uh, some others discussing the ability for us to make spe uh, specific qualifications that would allow uh, multi people in multifamily residential homes uh, to to have access to urban chickens should they want as well. Um, yeah, that's that's the broad thing there. I would say that one thing that was not. Um, addressed, I guess, by the, the staff report uh, in brief on this uh, is the question of whether or not we would like uh, to continue requiring neighbor consent uh, in these matters or uh, whether it will be neighbor notification just so that people are aware. Um, and that is an active conversation that I've had with uh, a number of members of council, um, you know, whether or not we have the specific consent or uh, the, the notification. So um, from there, I think that we just go into discussion, uh, I, I would presume, and, you know, yeah. yeah. I would say, I guess, uh, from there, I, I do support uh, the report from staff. Um, pretty, pretty much in every part, uh, except for raising uh, the particular fees, um, and then I would, I would further advocate for uh, neighborhood no neighbor notice rather than uh, consent within the uh, direct neighbor area. Well, I'd like to thank Councillor Dunn for for pursuing this. This has been um, an issue that I've certainly heard from residents in Iowa City asking that we revise the, the, um, the ordinance due to a variety of reasons, and I think, uh, you know, we, we can cover them all now. Um, I'll just, you know, the issues and questions for council consideration, the way it's laid out in the memo, I would say I certainly do not think uh, roosters are a good idea. And, I, and I'm speaking just for the sake of full transparency here. Uh, I'm one of the thir 30 people who have a chicken permit. <laughs> I didn't realize there were only 30 of us, but anyway, so I'm one of them. It's not an abstraction to me. We've had them for years. Um, you know, I can kind of speak to what the experience is in terms of, um, you know, many of the issues that, that we're discussing here. Uh, I also support the allowing them on multifamily buildings. Uh, I agree that... Uh, staff should be granted discretion with respect to a few site requirements, uh, increasing the number of hens to six. Uh, I, I do not support the idea of increasing the fee, and I, I did look at some other cities and their practices on this. Um, Cedar Rapids, it's an annual fee and it's $25 a year. Uh, one suggestion I would have is that we actually reduce the initial fee from $100 to $75, and then it's, so basically it's a $25 fee uh, per year. Some cities have no fee. 
Bloomington, Indiana, kind of went through a, an effort similar to this where they felt they had, were in effect disincentivizing something that uh, with, with fees and things of that sort that um, they decided to waive the fee. Uh, but my, my feeling is, okay, the, let's keep the fee, but I, I think certainly increasing it just raises the bar again. I think in my view, especially in that we're only talking about at this point uh, 30 permits, and perhaps one of the reasons we have 30 is because of the associated costs, because it's not just the permit. I mean, you have to build the coop. You have, the, you know, depending upon the food sources, you may have to purchase uh, chicken feed. Uh, so it's it's not an easy task, uh, and there are costs associated with it. I, I do think increasing the number of hens to six makes the financial um, aspects of this um, not quite as difficult. And then the, the last item, uh, I, I liked what Cedar Rapids was doing there too. There was no requirement to get permission, um, but be, because in a sense of the kind of unusual nature, perhaps we could say, of having chickens around um, in one's neighborhood, I think it's kind of the neighborly thing to do to just, just let people know that you're planning on getting chickens. Again, in my experience, uh, there's been nothing but um, strong support in the neighborhood for the fact that there are chickens around. Uh, the, the kids love them. They they are fascinated be, by the idea that uh, you know this is where uh, we get our eggs. You know there is something curious about going to the, the coop in the morning and they lay them in a box and you open up the lid to the box and there are eggs in there. <laughs> you know, I, I, we don't get our eggs from the supermarket. We get them you know, from the chickens who live right on our, our property. Um, so I, I think it's actually, there are many benefits to doing this. I was noticing that um, you know, in our uh, kind of, uh, what is it, the um, Accelerating our climate action plan, it, it talks about expanding access to healthy local foods. There's nothing more local than having f a food source in your backyard. Uh, so I, I think all we can do to try to, to make it easier, um, the better. And um, that's, that's why I landed where I did on these issues. I have to admit that uh, I've always been a big city girl, never been around uh, farms or chickens or anything, so I had to check around to, to see if the, the chicken doesn't need a rooster to lay eggs, and I found that out, that no, they don't. That's fertilized versus unfertilized, so that was kind of an interesting little tidbit. So uh, I, I would not be in favor. I, I agree with the, the staff's recommendation about not having the roosters, and we haven't had that many requests for roosters. The most requests, and I applaud the um, Prairie Hill folks, they were the first ones that I'd heard from about this because I hadn't thought about the uh, the way it reads now as being the single family units, and, and they're not really single family units. They have um, one unit that has like a number of studio apartments. So I don't know if we need to clarify that multi-family unit just a little bit more. Maybe Eric could help guide us on that so that they would be included in that because as it sounds now, it's a little confusing that maybe they wouldn't be uh, considered that because uh, what do you consider a multi-family unit? Uh, but I would be in favor of that. And I, I agree with the others that have said that uh, increasing the fee, I'm not in favor of that. And, the, and increasing to six hands, I agree with that too. Councillor, uh, do you have a stance on the, the consent versus notification? Uh, notification, I would I would think. Because I, 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 um, my daughter lives in the Longfellow neighborhood, and there's actually uh, several homes in that neighborhood that, that have chickens, and you'd never know it. Uh, and of course, she moved in after the fact, but was, wasn't notified that. But we just know from the neighbors saying. And occasionally on Facebook, they'll say, oh, one of the, one of the Dearborn chickens is, is loose. They, they occasionally do get loose, but nobody's really too alarmed about it, and it doesn't cause any harm. And the neighbors just kind of, okay, shoo, shoo, get back home. Uh, and it's really not a problem. So I would think, you know, but you might have some chicken haters out there. And so I think just notify them saying, hey, they're going to have this. If you notice that they're loose or they're causing a problem, let us know. So, I, yeah, notification would be fine with me. I agree. The no roosters, uh, yes, multifamily buildings, yes, staff should be granted some discretion 
Uh, maximum number of hens increased to six. I'm fine with the fee staying the same and notification rather than consent. I would agree with Councillor Burgess on all of those. I have one question though. What is the notification actually, other than just being a nice neighbor? I mean, does that accomplish much? I mean, if somebody gets a notification and then still wants to say, no, you can't do it, they, you know, I mean, that's, I guess. Well, I mean, obviously, legally, the difference between notification and consent is, you know, we could just, yeah, that if they say, no, you can't do it, well, I'm going to do it. I mean, that's. Yeah, that's kind of like, you know, there's, a, so I'm just, you know, if that's something we want to require people to notify if the neighbor, my neighbors don't have to notify me when they get a, a dog that barks. Sure. Um, you know, so that, I mean, as nice as that would be, but there still couldn't be, like, there wouldn't be much point of that. So I just, is that an extra step? that really, if we're gonna get rid of the requirement of um, having to get permission, do we really need to leave a notification step in there? That's, that's my question. I don't have a strong feeling on that, but I just wonder if it, as long as the notification doesn't actually trigger anything that anybody can, anybody else has a say in it. Nope. I that? guess the question that I might have for you on that same line, since you're, or anyone, um, what would be like a nuisance or example of nuisances to a neighbor? They don't bark. That's, they, arguably, um, dogs and cats, in my view, are much more potentially a nuisance than a chicken. Uh, the chickens are a danger to themselves if they're loose. I mean, there are a number of predators uh, that chickens have to be concerned about. We lost one of our chickens to a raccoon. Um, mm -hmm. And they, the other thing that's kind of interesting is uh, the hens tend to squawk which is not, in my view, an irritating sound, and it's not as repetitive or as frequent as a rooster, is when they're laying an egg. So that's sort of an indication that that's what's going on. <laughs> um, but as I said, it's, um, it, in my mind, the, the notification idea is that it is, in Iowa City, somewhat unusual to have chickens. So when they start hearing them, you know, just to let them know that um, in advance that this is what you're doing, and. You know, um, you're not expecting that there will be any impacts on the neighbors. and So like I said, I don't have a strong feeling, but in terms of us requiring that notification, so let's say I've got f four neighbors because, you know, some things connect a corner or whatever, and I have a neighbor who doesn't like chickens, and then they come to the city and say, well, this person never sent me a notification. Can you yank their permit to have that chicken? I mean, I don't want to put us in a position of having to, like, say, well, they didn't follow this step. That really is a step that doesn't really have any impact on whether or not they can have chickens in the first place. I mean, I don't know. Maybe I'm overthinking this. I so, Eric, would, that, would the onus be on the owner of the chickens, or would the city send out or, or animal uh, control send out and say such and such a neighbor has requested chicken permit? Well, when you said requested a permit, oh, I oh, are, are requested going from to the have, city. Yeah, yeah I yeah. understand your question now. Uh, well, I mean, that's entirely up to you. Uh, right now, the burden is on the, the owner, and they have to come. And I speak with some experience, because my next-door neighbor is apparently one of those 30 as well, uh, and uh, came by to uh, see if uh, it would be okay with us, and we said, sure. Uh, we got a plate out of cookies out of the deal, so we thought that was a pretty sweet deal. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, right now the burden's on them. We could keep it, you know, the same way. If you wish to see notification, to have it be on them, and they could provide some information about that. Or if it was important to you to know that that notification was being done, then probably it would be done by the city because then you would know for sure. Um, on a related matter, it, I want to point out, because I didn't make it clear before, that First Assistant uh, City Attorney Sue Dulick is here as well as Animal Services uh, Representative as well. Uh, so if you have questions uh, specifically about, you know, either kind of downsides to uh, moving from consent to notification or the ability to uh, continue doing the work without raising fees or uh, I think there was a question about what potential nuisances are out there with chickens and so forth, those folks are, are present and would be happy to uh, answer your questions if you wanted. I, I think I've got... Um a, a comment surrounding the the notification i think that the notification will serve to just say these are allowed i'm following the regulations they're permitted um you know just letting you know so that b because in the past we have had situations where people have had unpermitted chickens or you know people are also very unfamiliar to this this just serves as a you know just like was previously said a good neighborly thing to do i don't think that we link it to any you know revocation of of the permits for the chickens i think it just 
in my opinion, will lead to less headaches when, you know, the city gets calls saying, my neighbor, they showed up and they got half a dozen chickens in their backyard. I didn't hear anything about this. I think it's just best to say, okay, onus on the, on, on the, on the owner of the chickens to say, tell your neighbors these are these are legal um you know we're doing the right thing here uh don't be surprised if you see one around that's that's the way i see it uh, so i guess what the question will be is it a requirement f- a part of the for their permit i mean because if a neighbor chooses that they don't have a good relationship mm-hmm. or chooses not to go to their neighbor for whatever the reason may be um and just want to get the permit uh, i guess that's something that i want to get clear um, if it's not, you know, if the approval is not going to be whether the neighbor was notified or not, what is the real point of it being in the application except saying we encourage you to notify your neighbor? Yeah, we could do some should language rather than an actual requirement. Neighbors should or I applicants should idea. do that as a guideline very likely to be taken as what they have to do anyway sure. so any issues with the shit language <laughs> no I, okay. I think that's fine I, as i recall on um the cedar rapids chicken permits there is a box saying you have notified your neighbors check the box as i recall but you know i think should may be just as uh, effective I would invite our staff who administer the permits that if there's some thing that they've heard complaints about or some way that they could recommend, you know, things to let your neighbors know about if we had some sort of standardized verbiage or anything that might increase the likelihood of people letting their neighbors know. I'm not saying that's required, just to consider it. You need to identify yourself, too, yeah. I'm Devin Street from one of the animal service officers in Iowa City. No, I think that's a great idea. I don't think, I think that that is a big barrier for people and why they don't get chickens is getting permission. That's the biggest reason that I deny applications. So I think at least, you know, raising or dropping that bar, whichever perspective you take on it, is going to provide a lot more opportunity for everybody in Iowa City. And as far as the notifications, it is a kind thing to do, and we could certainly come up with something as you know, and invite the people who are applying for those applications, give them feedback. This is, you know, what we would recommend saying to your neighbors if that's something that you want to do. If you don't want to do, then don't. Um, but just kind of be the kind person to do it. And you know, like you said, some people just don't click with their neighbors, and it's just not going to happen. And that would probably create a riff and more arguments than it would be necessary so something if they have a good relationship sure but do you have an estimate just a, an educated guess on how many in the last couple of years you've had to turn down because of the the consent i've been doing this for two years and i think i've turned down two or three okay and it's only ever one neighbor usually it's because somebody's bought a house and they're flipping it and they don't want to have chickens in the yard next door and have that be a reason that they can't sell it and then some of them are just neighbors who just don't want chickens so if if we move forward with this would we also feel comfortable letting those people know that you know, their applications might be accepted this time. The people that have had their applications denied based on one neighbor not consenting. Sure. I, yeah. Are you, are you, at, are you I'm asking. you're saying that they can look in their records and go back to yeah. people or yes. the announcement is going to be on the front page and those are interested? Both. You can try again. Both. Yeah. yeah. I'm not sure about going back. I mean, but certainly. Would we do that for any other? Yeah policy changes to go back to people who are, you know, I mean, I realize it's a very small number, but I'm also like, if they're interested, this is, I just saw the photographer. I know that it's going to be covered. And, and so I guess I just wonder about, is this the type of thing that we would do for all shifts in our do you know it what I mean? It certainly seems like something that staff could exercise their discretion to do or not, and right. we're not directing yeah, sure. one way. But there. given yeah. that it's a handful. Yeah, it's very few. Three. So. <laughs> so. Any um, thoughts on, like, the fee? I, I think I'm fine with um, what 
it looks like the majority of council set up just keeping Maybe. the fee the same. Yeah. That's fine. I don't know if you all had any comments about the fee, um, if there was any comparison done to other uh, services that you all provide? No, we were just looking at the amount of time it takes us to put in to approve them. Some of them take significantly longer than others, but I think eliminating the need for permission from neighbors is going to significantly eliminate a lot of time that we spend on those applications, because sometimes it can take us weeks to get a hold of landlords or property owners to be able to get that approval. So even if that's something where you're looking at knocking it down to the 75, then that's more justifiable too, because it takes, it takes a lot of work off of our plate trying to get that figured out. Any other questions? All right, well, I've heard a majority of the council um, say no roosters. <laughs> um, yes to Coos being allowed a multi-family buildings consistent with the staff recommendations. Um, staff being granted discretion, um, as well as the hand count to up to six. And then uh, council wants to keep the application fee at $100 as it is currently. And then there will be um, no um, neighbor uh, consent, required consent, and just some, um, maybe a pamphlet or something to those being granted just to share with their neighbors should they choose. All right. Okay, we'll uh, draft up the ordinance and have it for you, uh, your consideration in a future meeting. Thank you. All right, awesome. We're gonna move on to item number two, which is review of the 2020 preliminary plan to accelerate community policing. And I do see our chief uh, listing is present with us. Um, and so um, I'll invite you up at this time. <coughs> Good afternoon, Mayor and Council, Dustin Liston, Chief of Police. As you can see, the uh, city manager provided a memo. It's a pretty in-depth memo going over each of the 36 proposed uh, changes when the uh, when the plan was submitted to you, I believe it was in December of 2020. It was just before I got here, actually. But we've been steadily knocking off things or completing tasks on that. We're for the most part, uh, we've gotten most of them done. If you if you look through the memo, you can see an update on each one of those. Uh, there's a couple of them that we weren't able to do, or there may have not have been interest of the council. A couple things staffing wise, we haven't been able to get to yet. But I'm I'm pretty proud of the work that's been done on that. But I think now is an opportunity for you all to weigh in on where you'd like us to go with it. If there's things you want, you know, this was a plan that was done two years ago by or two and a half years ago by the city manager's office. And um, there, we can certainly take it many different directions. It wasn't an end all, it wasn't, it was just a start. You know, it was the preliminary plan and it's a constant evolution. It's a, I like to think of it as a live document that we can keep changing. And with, with your all's guidance, we're happy to try new things or work on new projects. So it's just an opportunity. If you have any questions of me, anything you saw in there, I'll be more than happy to answer them. I have a number of sort of like this laundry list of comments and questions, yeah. but um, I figure I'm just going to jump in for a couple of like what I hope are just quick hitters because I know that there are other counselors who have sort of like perhaps bigger scope questions. Um, and I noticed also in going through this that there's a number of these bullets that actually kind of intersect. So one of them um, that struck me um, that while it's been done, it's number 26, and it was about doing the PSA for, um, excuse me while I find the specific language. Um, Race-based calls? Yes. Yes. Just to think of that as a recurring sure. event, because it's great that it was given there, but as we all know, people be like, I missed it. What are you talking about? Mm -hmm. huh? right? So I just think that there could be that repetition of having this be at the, at the least an annual event of getting this out through all the different channels as possible. I think that that's just sort of a good thing to, to build into kind of SOP um, to, to make sure people are aware of it. Um, and then I did have a question as well, and maybe this is something, this is a broad question, but I noticed this in um, um, something that in fact 
I know private therapists, right, when you call to make an appointment, they actually, if you hit their voicemail, they say, if this is an emergency, please hang up and dial 911. That has not, the, the 988 number has not actually gotten sort of like filtered through so that primary mental health caregivers are, are not sort of incorporating that in. And I was just wondering, actually, as a working session collective body, if we could think about how that could go out there. And maybe it's just an item for us to follow up on. Um, I'm not sure how the city does this with individuals, but I know that there's a number of partnerships and and, and interconnections and relationship building that the, the police department has. So that would be one area that's perfect for starting to spread that. Sure. Um, so I have a lot of other things, but I'm gonna pause because those are just sort of like quick hit type things and, and, and allow others to, to maybe talk more thematically about a few things um, so that I don't monopolize right now. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem, just a quick question on this, and maybe Chief, Chief Liston can help on this with the uh, Joint Emergency Communications Commission. Uh, I've been, I'm on that committee, and I know they've been talking about integrating the 988 into the 911 calls, and I don't know if that would help with what you're talking about or mm -hmm. what your thoughts on that, Chief Liston, are that that's mm -hmm. going to help with that to, uh, to more closely know which calls big... need to go where. Yeah, and I think they're current. The pilot pro project just started the diversion with nine. It just started this month, actually. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious to, I'm anxiously awaiting the results of that. But uh, we're headed in the right direction on that with community taking the lead on it. Chief, thank you for being here. Really appreciate it. Um, I just wanted to get some clarification on uh, update 10. Um, update 10 is about, uh, let me scroll up here just mm -hmm. to be sure, um, CIT training. So uh, I'm, there was no specific statistic in there as to how many of our officers have been CIT trained or trained in de-escalation techniques. So I'm wondering if you can more so shed light onto either those numbers or if this is a standard part of onboarding and so all officers are trained. Yes, all officers in Johnson County are trained. We, we host the class annually. It's usually hosted every May. And for the new officers that we've onboarded in the countywide, whether it's a deputy or whether it's someone from North Liberty, they all go to it. So that's one of the things we were really proud of as a county, that for the last several years we've been able to do that. It's a week-long course, and it's taught by... Uh, community partners, by our staff, every department in the in the county provides staff to teach, and then there's local mental health providers that that teach it. It's, I, I think we're probably one of the uh, leaders in that in the state. Uh, I, I can tell you that even my former agency, the, everyone wasn't CIT trained, so that everybody on our department is CIT awesome. trained. Thank you for the clarification. Who comes up? Uh, I'm just curious now. The, the who creates the curriculum for that? Do, do uh, we do that in house, or is that from? Well, it's it's with a group. We work with our, our partners at the county as well, and then our local mental health providers. Okay. Uh, they they teach portions of it. It it's been the curriculum was created years ago, and uh, we keep. We keep updating it. We have two in-house instructors, uh, Colin Fowler and Andrew McKnight. They've they present at the annual CIT conference. Uh, they they've been doing this for quite a while, and they're very good at it. Mental health was mentioned, and and I just have to speak for myself to say that it, it has to continue to be a priority uh, for all of us, uh, and, and for the um, mental health workers out there, and the police department. And uh, I had some concerns because I, and no one from communities here, though I don't know, but maybe you can speak to it. They've had some trouble, like filling the positions. Do you know if they, um, if they're searched, do they search outside of the area? Do they, is it possible to do a nationwide search? Go to the schools that you know graduate uh, people that are uh, major in psychology and, and treating mental health issues, or maybe you won't, won't be able to answer that. But that's my concern because I think that's a priority. We, it's it's becoming increasingly more important and more so than just having the nine eight eight number out there. Right. Uh, I have a meeting with Sarah Nelson next week, and we're going to talk about that. I'm assuming they're having staffing issues just like everybody else does. Mm -hmm. I know they they do recruit and they put out, I, but I, I wouldn't, I couldn't speak to exactly what they do for recruiting efforts. But uh, I, I think they're having just staffing issues, just like every other. Uh, agency and and you know it's hard to get people in the workforce now and that's a, I don't need to tell you guys yeah, that's a difficult true, that's job true. 
it's a difficult job, and you're, we're asking a lot of those people, especially right now. So, just to make sure I'm clear, that's actually we help fund that position, but the position itself is communities, not ours. Correct. Correct. It's an employee of communities. We have one. Uh, we had two. That person left, and they're they're still trying to fill that second position. Okay. Just making sure that that's. Mm -hmm. Yep, not our employee though. Thank yeah. You. Well, I'll just jump in with maybe kind of a zoomed out uh, conversation. I hope that maybe we can talk about some goals to move forward. As um, Chief, you said, like this is a living document and the plan sort of changes as uh, we accomplish various things. I think it's really fantastic to see some of these um, specific, you know, action items within the plan that have been that at the time we're like, we could, you know, years from now <laughs> try and have integrated 911 and uh, mobile crisis response. And yeah, that went live last week, I think. So it's really, really, really powerful to see many of these things coming along. Um, given the conversations that we've had about the budget and the department and staffing and challenges in staffing, I think looking at kind of the two areas on the front end of the continuum of calls for service is what I would urge us to, to try and do and see if we can even set some, some goals that might be measurable. In the context of trying to set goals, I, I noticed in Jeff's memo the um, kind of a warning to us, I think, of you need good data as well as the fact that the department's data analyst position is unfilled, right? That, that remains the case. And that was um, Dave Schwint, I believe, who... Um, has retired. Right. He still works a little bit part time for us as much as we can ask him to do. But yeah, yeah. You're right. It's and so I think those those things do somewhat go together because whatever we direct as areas of emphasis or however we decide to prioritize um, uh, parts of the plan, I think it's really important that we make sure we have those mechanisms for tracking the information. Um, I do know just from even talking with Jeff this last Friday that I think his intent is to update the statistics that were in this plan from December 2020 on things like um, calls for service and percentage of calls that are behavior based and that kind of thing because it's been a few years since we've had that data and I think it'll be really important to see trends. But what I would urge us to consider is to really focus on that front end of the continuum of calls for service, which is prevention and diversion. And if we can um, ask the department and the city manager to say, what, what actions do you think you know, the city can take to help prevent calls for service? Some of the things that um, were highlighted in the plan is that the support that we provide to nonprofits is part of prevention, right? Making sure that people have resources available and that those resources are robust is part of preventing the people getting to a point where they may be in crisis and they may need to call. Another thing is, so there's that financial support, which we have various buckets already for. Um, and we could consider asking for projects that um, from nonprofits to say, you know, this particular bit of this aid to agencies or whatever bucket it might want, we might want to um, staff might want to suggest, like give us projects that you believe as a service provider would help on the prevention side. Like what do you think would help keep people from getting to crisis most effectively based on what you see in the community? That's one possible idea. Um, I think we've also talked about the educational component and I think the PSA, uh, Megan, that you mentioned is one small piece of that, right? Like don't call the cops for, you know, because you see uh, children running around in the neighborhood you haven't seen there before, something like that. I think there's a lot more that we could do on that communication side and using staff, um, even just like our communication staff outside the department and Lee's position, which is within the city manager's office, to try and use some of that data-driven analysis to say, what are those most common resident-initiated calls for service where the officers themselves because I can identify, we're not the best equipped to do this, or we don't think this should have been a call in the first place, and just create some education around that. I know we did the race-based calls, but I don't know, Chief, do you know if we've actually done that analysis of what people no, are No, but we do for? have... A 
just because we don't have that position filled, we still do have people who can get stats. So, um, and I think that is important. One of the things I think we most of us know, some people might be surprised, is how few, how a few number of people call the police all the time. And that's one of the things we do with our community outreach is, and also with our mental health liaison is let them know what when it is appropriate and when it's not. We certainly don't want to discourage people from calling the police when they need to call police, but for some people it's their first, that's their fir the first thing they think of instead of calling a neighbor or call, you know. So that's one of the things I think there's a big opportunity. We do, we try to reach those people who we know are heavy users of 911, um, but uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. And another thing I know you've been working on that Jeff has shared with me is looking at um, interventions based on locations for concentrations of calls for service. So if we get a ton of calls at one particular spot, just trying to get underneath that and say, what's happening that there are so many calls for service in that spot? So I think that that would be something we could set, you know, measurable goals to try and reduce, you know, on a percentage basis or a per capita basis. Um, on the prevention side. And then lastly, on the prevention side, just the, you know, the number one um, action item that we articulated in our strategic plan under the safety, and by number one, I mean it was at the top of the, <laughs> the list of described action items, was um, the community violence interruption, which I don't know, Mayor, if you have any updates on that yes. program. Yes. Um, that. Yeah, well, one, I want to say um, thanks for this document. Uh, it, I think you mentioned some of the things that we thought was a dream, um, and here we are at 9A8, you know, being in action and stuff like that. And I would agree that the prevention, um, uh, you know, some thoughts on prevention with our social service agencies would be good. Um, certainly, we'll see how 988 kind of really um, get to going within our community. Um, I am a part of the community violence intervention uh, steering committee. Uh, we just hired our director who is um, going to be starting the first meeting, uh, yes, tomorrow. Um, and so that'd be uh, great. There are some, uh, some great community um, folks around the table and looking forward to that. So we've had about three meetings and a lot of that was um, just getting some background about what this could look like as well as um, Talking about who, uh, the uh, who were what we wanted to see in the person that would lead us in this effort as a staff, and so uh, we accomplished hiring someone, and tomorrow will be their first day meeting with the steering committee. So um, more to be uh, more on that in the near future. Um, there's not much that I really wanted to um, like dig into the report about, um, except I wanted to make sure that um, the prevent of course the prevention or things that we're doing for the mental health I think Councillor Teller talked about that is going to be at the forefront um, of what we want to accomplish as this council is making sure that we're talking to our partners to make to have those conversations like what can we do different um, you know the communication piece the P PSA is going to be um, critical. The, the thing that I also wanted to mention is that um, I feel like the conversation is very s separate to a certain degree if we're talking about cutting police positions. I, that, in my opinion, needs to ha be had at staff level uh, within the department as they're seeing uh, different trends or they're looking at what their staffing ratios are. So I just wanted to be clear that, you know, my hope is that we can focus in on, you know, the document before us, what are ways that we can really enhance the services um, was missing. Um, and I think those collaborations, as Councilor Berg has mentioned, going to those service providers is great uh, just to say, hey, what, what, you know, what are you seeing and what can we do as a, um, really as a, as a team, because it's beyond just the city and the police department working on this. Well, and I would add, too, that in that prevent, you know, we're looking at that graphic that has prevent, divert, co-respond, stabilize, and connect, and it really is all the way over at prevention that, in honesty, so much of our strategic plan is actually 
focused on doing that because the core issues that create trauma and behavior that ends up, you know, perhaps hurting self, hurting others, has to do with things like food insecurity, education issues, transportation. So the very things that we as a city are looking at in these other pillars really are part of a holistic framework that is to help the police, to help the community um, not get to a point where there's police response. It's to to make sure that we don't get there. So that's just, I mean, I think of it as um, we're having a very specific conversation about the 36 points. And, and I am, I truly was bowled over when I saw how much work has been done in such a short amount of time and during the pandemic as well, right? Um, so thank you for that. Um, but I also realized I'm like, the onus is on us as well. Um, in, in those four types of responses, what we want to do is, is bolster Iowa City as a place that can help mitigate or, or lessen the stressors that lead to, to other things. So sort of sounds soapboxy, but I just felt like it. it also is sort of like that's what we do in every meeting is trying to figure out is affordable housing, free fare for buses, how do we get people to, uh, you know, child care. So we have all of these other things, and that's part of looking at the whole of how do we have a good public safety. Um, so that's, that's one thing. Um, so I'm off my soapbox now. But I have a question for you in, because you've been living with this and you have your teams and your departments, you know, doing this work all the time. What do you see, what, what's missing in here? What opportunities do you want to, do you think could be useful? Have, and I know this is pretty exhaustive mm -hmm. and yet I'm sure it's not exhaustive. So I was just wondering if there was anything missing on here that you're like, you know what, I think this would really this could be another piece that could really help the efforts. You know, I think some of the things we just, like the, the mayor mentioned, the uh, violence interruption mm -hmm. uh, thing, that, that's one thing that probably should have been on here, but I don't think we knew about it at the time. So there's, just because it's not on this list doesn't mean it's not something we're doing. Right, um, right. I think this was, a, as the memo pointed out, this is something that city staff came up with in a, in a few months two and a half years ago trying to anticipate where all this was headed. And I think they did a pretty good job of it, but it doesn't encompass everything. There's not one thing that I think, oh, you know, that should have been here. And if, if there is, we're doing it anyhow. Just because it's this isn't this isn't the only thing we're doing. We're doing plenty of different things right. that just didn't make the list. Um, you know, I think filling our specialty positions would be helpful, specifically the, the crime analyst. I used to run a group of crime analysts at my former agency, and I know the value that they provide. It, it makes us work a lot smarter rather than harder. So I, I, I want to get to that. And I, I think in most agencies that typically becomes a civilian position. Anyhow, you don't have to spend a, a sworn officer position on that spot. So that's a, I, I would anticipate seeing that on my next budget request, just sneak preview. So, um, but uh, that's, that's something I, I think we would look at. And then that would open up uh, having a really quality uh, crime analysts would really give us a lot of information like Councillor Burgess was talking about that then we can base these decisions off of. So. A part uh, of the, oh, go right ahead. Sure. Well, I was just going to mention a part of the community inter intervention uh, violence, community violence intervention uh, program that we talked about so far was identifying some of those offenders you'll determine which um, you know, individuals you want to go out after, and it really is a community effort. You bring in family, you bring in friends to try to connect with them and say, hey, can we, ch you know, turn this around? And so um, looking forward to, uh, you know, this community uh, or this, um, this committee, steering committee, diving into this a little bit uh, so that we can get some um, activities out in the community with some of these individuals. And so, um, like I said, she's just starting. Um, and so we'll have the first meeting with her tomorrow to take us through a, a, a lot of next steps. Um, 
Well, first of all, wanted to uh, say thanks because, as you pointed out, this document was sort of created um, right before you got here. Um, and so since you've been here, you can go through this list and, and check a lot of boxes, um, see the progress. Uh, some things accomplished, some things progress, some things you know still need to be done, or maybe different priorities need to be picked out. So thank you for that, and thank you to the department for, for doing that. Um, and thank you also to city staff who put together this update. Um, 36 different moving pieces, and as you say, there's more to the picture than just these 36. That's a lot of work, and putting this together in a way that's understandable and digestible was really helpful. Um, and hopefully it's something, too, that members of the public you know, are aware they can go on to the packets, information packet and look through themselves. Um, I, think, I just think it's, it's a lot of useful information. One of my questions is actually more for the council, although certainly would involve staff and, and, and the chief. What do we want to do with this now? Um, this update is great, and I, and I love this, but I, I was too thinking about, as I'm reading through these, like, oh, so here's some stuff we should go back and maybe look at. Um, you know, I don't know, something, you know, or is the training enough? Well, what other sorts of things for coordination? So my question is, do we want to uh, direct staff to, like, you know, update this for 2023, you know, as opposed to 2020? Um, you know, is that something worthwhile doing so that we can look at which things and, you know, kind of go, which things do we need to keep pushing on? Which things do we need to refocus? Um, what are some of the new efforts that we have to include in that? Um, as a way to sort of, I don't know, give us a roadmap, just like we do with a strategic plan, so that the council's giving some, like, hey, you know, these are the things that we think are priorities. And so then, you know, every couple of years further down the road, then we can come and say, okay, how have we done on these? And uh, is that a direction we want to head in? I know that that's, we're asking resources and, and, and things like that, but um, but that seems like, you know, that, that's when I was reading this, that just seemed like the logical thing. Is how how do we move forward? Because there's good stuff here, but what's next? So we did have a graph, um, and it would it it had um, one that said completed, mm -hmm. um, in progress, mm -hmm. and then one that said ongoing. You know, it is you always have to be working on it. It's never sure. ending. Sure. Um, so. Certainly, we can um, do that. I wonder if there is not a because when you look at all of this, you know, continuously, you could kind of get lost and not focused. Right. Right. Um, so I wonder if there is not a way for us to do that first step again. You know, in progress. You know, complete it. Um, ongoing, and if it's more of <laughs> looking at our strategic plan and tying into sure. you know some of this i think that would be helpful yeah and that's you know, for example we talked about hiring a second liaison well maybe as we take a look at a new set of priorities yes that but maybe a third and fourth or getting up to that 24 7 would be as we take a look at what does that goal look like now three years later as we update this kind of stuff and to me that would be probably worth some time and sure. effort although you know, that would involve a lot of stakeholders. But. Mm -hmm. well, I, I think ideally, if we can quantify goals that are based around outcomes, right, and then staff figures out how to achieve that. I mean, I think, you know, I get uncomfortable saying, uh, despite my last several months of advocating, I get uncomfortable saying, like, which position should be doing what. I mean, I think saying um, having round-the-clock service for co-response for behavioral and mental health calls as a priority within X number of time, and then staff, you figure it out. I would be more comfortable with that that kind of direction you know so on the prevention side like saying right now we have x number of calls per service per capita per year per month or however you want to quantify it we would like to see some measurable reduction and right now we don't know because we're not looking at the data in that particular way but we could say what it is now and we could put something aspirational just to benchmark against right to say okay if we direct prioritizing a reduction in calls, you know, a prevention of calls for service based on education, based on, um, you know, location-based interventions, whatever it is. Um, but the staff would be deciding the how, we set the metrics, and then we come back in a year. Because I think plans like this are, you know, it's just sort of like a snapshot in time. 
right? It's just sort of like, these are the actions that we know about. And I don't feel like we are the best equipped to say this particular action, you know, is the way to achieve that goal. Great. I think I can see kind of a hybrid of that sort of going with kind of like a in creation of an update would be sort of that like if we say exactly what you'd said here's what we want to have for an outcome and then give that to staff and have staff say okay well that's here's what we think we want to put and then we can kind of like what they did with I assume I guess you, some of you were here some of us were here some of us weren't um, but that kind of a process like we want to see better uh, interventions with mental health that don't require you know, we want want to see more compassionate care, everything else. And so, but, I, but what I like about these, what appeals to me about this list is there were concrete, actionable things, which now we see the, I think I see a benefit in that now because when they go back and say, what have you done with this? It's not just, it, it's, it's defined enough mm -hmm. that you can't just sort of throw some clever words at it and mm -hmm. make it sound good. There's little things you can either say did or did not happen or have happened up to this degree. And I find real value in that. I have a question for the police chief. Some of the stuff that's in this um, document, you have in your report um, or in a report. Do you have any of this in a report of any type? I, I don't understand what you're asking. So do you do, uh, so in an annual report? Oh, yes, absolutely. And yes. that's, I know it's June now, but uh, it's, the, the draft is done. We'll be publishing it by probably the end right. of the week. But yeah, it'll have, but it, it'll look very similar to last year's report. You know, it, it's big numbers, not diving in on specifically mental health calls. But that, you know, I think once we, especially if we get some of these positions filled, we could maybe take deeper dives. I don't know if it needs to be in the annual report, but certainly would influence some of the decisions we're making. But yes, we do have some of this, some of these statistics in the annual so report. So what I was just getting to is that, um, you know, some of this, what we would like to see on an annual basis can be in a report from the chief, from the chief's office, potentially. Well, I, I too, I, Councillor Burgess's emphasis on sort of focusing on the prevention end of the continuum has always been my focus. Um, and it happens to kind of intersect with an aspect of living in Iowa City that where I feel most unsafe. And that's traffic. Uh, you know, it's one case where I kind of relinqu relinquish my privilege and primarily walk around Iowa City as opposed to drive around Iowa City. Although I will say, even since this report was, was published, that cars have gotten bigger. Uh, they are astonishingly larger in size uh, and weight. Uh, and it seems like it's sort of just been upon us in the last several years. Uh, and they're going, they seem to be going faster. So it seems to me the concerns I've had have only been exacerbated by, by those two facts. And we have a lot of information on traffic as well. And um, so I think it lends itself to the metrics. Uh, and in fact, it was you know, the report that highlighted for me that 25% of our calls for service are traffic and collision related. Um, that's, you know, comparing traffic to, say, mental health. Mental health is about 9%. So it's a, it's a huge number, really. And there, what I was arguing back in 2020 was there are two ways I saw that we could try to reduce calls for service. One had to do with the redesign of our streets, many of which, in effect, encourage illegal speeding. So the idea of self-regulating streets, where we redesign our streets, and we have some in the strategic plan. I don't know what their status is, which is one of my frustrations uh, in terms of trying to reduce calls for service. You know, Burlington, Market, Jefferson, Dodge, Governor are some of our major streets where I suspect uh, self-regulating those streets um, in, in the ways that would be appropriate could very well reduce our calls for service and make our streets more safe. Um, the other, which is n noted in the, in the report, was that um, the majority on city council has shown, not shown an interest in revisiting the technology of traffic cameras. And, and you also noted that a number of cities are now considering or have in fact, I think, approved uh, the use of traffic cameras. Uh, Dubuque, Marion, 
I guess they're considering as well as um, University Heights. I, I think in a way that may, to me that's a suggestion that this is, you know, the, the, the fact that our streets seem less safe is a phenomenon that's wa widespread. Um, in fact, you know, locally we just, two people died on our streets. I mean, that to me was a big deal. Uh, I understand that one could say, well, you know, these were outlier events and however one might want to try to normalize them, but to me, our streets need to be, the speeds we see on our streets need to be slowed down. Uh, and I'm, I'm understanding that in many cities, this whole idea of drag racing on city streets is common. Um, so how can we redesign those streets so that it's more difficult for that type of drag racing to take place? But with respect to the, the cameras, and I, I personally, you know, as I emphasized this in 2020, and, and deliberately said, let's pull back on the cameras and just see if we can better design our streets uh, and approach it that way first, and then consider the cameras. At this point, I at least am interested in seeing the council, you know, if you're asking for ways of, of reducing calls for service, um, we reconsider that. And I think what, when, when we first moved here 13 years ago, I think the consideration was highways one and six, uh, that the police department was proposing the cameras. Those seem like very logical streets to consider if we were to use cameras. Um, they're difficult, I would imagine, to regulate, to self-regulate, and we know they're, again, we have the data that shows that they're there's a lot of collisions that are taking place there. Um, so I personally have gone through a, you know, kind of a change of position on the use of cameras. I do feel uh, on our state highways one and six, we, we should consider them. Self-regulating those streets, I think, would be very time consuming and expensive. Uh, arguably, and the way I would want to argue the use of the cameras would be whatever revenues they generate could be earmarked for uh, advancing, making our streets safer. Uh, because in some cases it does cost real money to, to do that. Um, but again, this is a, you know, 25% of our calls for service. It's a huge piece where it contribute, the current situation out on the streets, um, I, you know, many people do not feel safe. Um, I don't feel safe. I don't think I'm alone in this. And uh, it also frustrates people moving to bicycling or walking because they just simply don't feel safe doing those things, uh, as well as driving. I mean, I'm seeing, you know, um, with these larger cars, I don't feel all that safe at certain intersections because I, my sight lines are, are compromised by large parked vehicles um, that don't allow me to see what's coming. Um, so anyway, that's sort of where I am on this. I, I really feel that th that is 25% of our calls for service. I, I'd be interested to know to what degree that number has dropped, um, but I think it's something I think potentially lends itself to seeing significant um, calls for reductions in calls for service if we proactively, uh, and as I said, approach this. There are some in our strategic plan, but you know, the movement has been a little bit slow up to this point. Um, but on highways one and six, perhaps we, we should consider, revisit that and consider the cameras. So I, it's interesting that you brought up the cameras because I did, as in reading this point, think through, there could be potentially um, a help with the reduction in service um, calls. That said, I would definitely and I'm sure that this would be something that, if it got to it, that we would consider very carefully where the placement of them are. I'm One of the main reasons for the 36 points was actually talking about Black Lives Matter and about equity concerns. And so if we only put cameras on one and six, that runs right through the South District. So to me, that seems it's actually potentially exacerbating um, the issue. So. I think that we would want to be very careful to think about, and I'm and I'm with you on saying this could actually, because I'm kind of thinking of this again in those four parts. And on the one hand, we want prevention of calls, but it's, I'm also thinking about, and I know that there's uh, a, a section of the public that 
is not all that concerned with this, but I'm very concerned with how the professionalism and the um, career health of the department is doing. And so the amount of overtime that officers are having to spend is unacceptable, um, and yet that's the job right now, for them to be able to give the service that, um, you know, whether it's heavy, heavy callers or honest needs and we have a lot of there's not going to be any one solution right but at the same time that we're looking at prevention we also need to be looking at how we can support those people who are actually still the serving um, the community um, in very important ways so I do think to it's a long-winded way to get to where you're at to say I think it's worth thinking about the use of cameras, but it would have to be very, very <clears throat> intentional and very, very careful because Highway 1 and 6 are not used for pedestrians because they are state. Um, you're correct uh, that there's a lot of traffic incidents, but uh, it's also a major thoroughfare for um, people all along in, in your district, Pauline, and, and in mine. So, at any rate, I'm just kind of spinning in a couple of different directions about this to say, to respond to you that I think it could be worth thinking about. But the other piece is that at the same time that council right now has been looking a lot, and rightfully so, at prevention, we also need to look at how are we going to support the people in this department who are doing really hor hard jobs and who are doing it under the weight of, frankly, a lot of public opinion that makes their jobs even harder. Um, so I just, as we look at ways to be able to restructure the police departments, also about how are we going to help support them too? I think you, you actually kind of, uh, you, you, uh, you anticipated the next comments I was going to make, which was to say that the prevention very important, absolutely our emphasis, you know, that preventing uh, everything we can do and all the things you've mentioned earlier about ways to prevent crime, but also when responses have to happen. And so as we take a look at the strategic, uh, oh, not strategic plan, if we look at re redoing this plan, I just wanted to also voice the idea that some of the stuff in this that needs to continue to be brought forward that I thought was really positive was looking at what do those responses look like. So. Um, discussions about the field training program, the critical incident training program. Um, oh, there's a number of different uh, different things. Uh, the uh, the uh, mental health support for the officers themselves. Um, things like that too are things that I, I would certainly not want to fall away because we didn't mention it up here. So I was going to specifically mention some of those things uh, because I think that is important. When we have responses, we want that response to be the best quality for our, our public. And we do, you know, we, we do also, we manage human beings, right? That we're sort of the bosses of, of all of our city employees, including the police department. So we do have, I think, a responsibility to be fair and good bosses in that if we ask somebody to do a job, we should give them the tools to do that job and do it safely and to provide a, the best possible service for our, our community members. And, you know, policing is obviously its own special thing, but some of those things I think hold true and burnout and those kinds of things, which you brought to us before, uh, you know, a year ago, I think we were hearing about concerns about some of that, um, which is important for us to hear and, and good, for, good for us to know that as well. So we can include that in our, in our calculations. So that would be something too that, um, you know, I think that's important. That, so we, we, the prevention won't always work and we do have responses. What does that response look like? What's the quality of that response? And how do we, how do we then come up with action items to try and, you know, us or for staff or to give, you know, support staff and their initiatives, which is kind of what this is, right? They've listed priorities and we've supported those, um, sometimes through funding different programs and positions, sometimes through just other sorts of support, um, hopefully praise from time to time uh, as well. Um, and so, yeah, so I mean, just the, so those things don't fall away and, and, and nobody would mistake that those aren't also priorities uh, as well as, you know, the very, very worthy priorities of prevention. So council, oh. Can I just follow up on that yes. real quick, Mayor? Um, so I think having, you know, I appreciate all, all of those comments and I think no department should have to run with two and a half hours of overtime for every hour of regular service, which I think was the statistic that Jeff gave us um, a couple months ago. And so I think as long as we're in the moment that we've been in for a few years of not having as many staff as you know you would like to have that service level be 
more manageable for the officers. Really looking at, you know, things to take off the plate of the department and the 988-911 integration and the mobile crisis bump that we gave with the ARPA money. I mean, I think there's even more opportunities there and for us to look at, you know, continuing the support of those first responders that, you know, if they don't require an officer, we can hopefully on the front end say someone else can attend to those kinds of things. Um, I appreciate and I hear, you know, the chief and I have talked before about uh, officers want to be able to respond to calls that are just helpful, you know, and not just uh, responding to acute criminal situations. Um, and I think as long as we have officers, they're going to continue to do that. And I think having the, um, the opportunities for, you know, Mayor and I have talked about the kinds of calls that the fire department responds to and listening to the fire chief talk about um, really looking at their role as risk elimination or risk reduction for the community. So just to come back to, um, Sean, your point about, like, concrete things, um, I, I think we might want to hear from some of those providers on, like, what, what are ways that they could pick up more calls that we know are happening if the dispatch is effective, right? Um, I was pitched from Community Crisis Services, a model that not just would have mental health workers, but would have a nurse practitioner, medics, and mental health providers who could be dispatched as one unit. Because currently, mobile crisis can only respond to behavioral mental health um, calls, and they make referrals, but they can't prescribe, and they can't deal with injuries um, effectively. So if we think of all the calls for service that are medical, on the fire department side, on the ambulance side, and the proportion, you know, in this report that are even police respond to. I just think there's a lot of opportunities there that could help relieve some of the pressure that the department is currently handling and would achieve the goal of diverting calls for service to unarmed professionals, which was a actual goal that we've articulated. So, so I think if we want to hear a presentation from folks on that, in a future work session, that would be a concrete thing we could do. I think just really quickly to, um, we should acknowledge uh, the work of our CPRB, our police review board, because uh, at the time that we were setting these things up, I think we were one of the very few in the area, the cities or communities that, that had one, and I think other cities sort of based their development on, on ours. And so I'd just like to commend and, uh, and appreciate their, their the decisions they make, and I think that we need to do what we can to um, make sure that they ha always have a full and, and active board, and um, I, I just really appreciate and would not like to acknowledge them. I was just going to say very quickly to follow up, I would be interested in a working session that would um, bring others together because, in fact, I think it was you that I was talking to that um, the analogy that I used was that the fire or that the police department is finding itself, I think, in, in a lot of times because 911 is so ubiquitous that um, it's like the, the, the school district, right? There's so much that's put on your plate that isn't necessarily like your primary response. Um, and so I, I like the idea of being able to say, how do, we, how do we kind of spread this around so that the right professionals are there without taking away any of the expertise of the police? And, and, and I strongly believe that it should not just be acute criminal or what, whatever the phrase was that you used. It was very well said. Um, I think that the police need to be involved in the community in a, in a lot of different ways um, that actually is documented here. But I like the idea of being able to see, are there others that where that response could be? So I would be in favor of, of a working session at some point where there is a presentation from these others. So I'm sorry, I cut you well, off, yeah, Andrew. Okay. I just want to respond to that. If really quickly, I would be in I would be in favor of a work session, but I believe that the our police department and our fire department or whoever is a part of that system should have meetings before that comes to us. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, so I think I just want to kind of summarize uh, a, a bit of my thoughts. I mean, throughout this whole conversation, 
I keep getting to this thought of yes and. Uh, in that way, I, I agree with you, Councilor Harmson, that I, I kind of see a really good opportunity for uh, um, a melding of different perspectives up here, the, the uh, focusing on you know, what we want our goals to be uh, and what we want um, the, the situation to be uh, that Councilor Burgess talks about, uh, as well as also defining some of these, these specific goals. I think that um, just the fact that so much has been accomplished uh, of this plan demonstrates that when we give specific goals, we can expect, uh, you know, pretty, pretty good results uh, in, in most cases. Um, so, you know, I, I agree with the focus on prevention. I think that the prevention needs to be data-driven, which, you know, leads us to more community partnerships, leads us to, uh, you know, a, a greater importance on that, on that analyst position. Um, at the same time, I think that there's an even further argument uh, to, to go for uh, the, the specific goals um, in, in combination with uh, the, the, or pardon me, Rewriting the plan, I should say, uh, or, or updating the plan. Uh, let's let's say that. Um, in addition to giving those broader goals at the same time, I think that they are enriched by happening uh, and being implemented simultaneously. Um, and ultimately, I see it as uh, you know we this this document was created uh, in a moment, like was previously said. It, it it signifies the thoughts and feelings and ideas of a particular moment, um, and we are now far past that moment. Uh, and so I think that it's it would be a good idea for us to go back through this plan, um, set those those broader goals for for the department and public safety in this community, um, while at the same time not allowing the the progress that has been achieved uh, to stagnate and to continue to push ourselves uh, to strive for excellence in the service that we deliver. I think that that's what everyone, um, including the chief uh, and, on, and on this uh, body, wants to do. And I, I personally think that that um, you know, best happens through us being uh, active participants and active uh, community members and, and observers and allowing ourselves to set those goals and, and, and kind of work through staff to make sure that this is something that is continually updated, something that we are continuing to work for uh, towards with uh, regards to prevention. Um, while at the same time understanding that there are, you know, rapidly developing challenges that occur in our community, um, specifically uh, the challenges with juveniles. Juveniles are not spoken about even one, but, but once <laughs> in this plan. And um, having seen uh, a number of incidences myself and also having heard about those incidences um, in some of our weekly emails, uh, I, I think that addressing the problems that we are seeing with juveniles in the community needs to be something um, that we look at in both this prevention and actual deliberate manner. Um, so th all that is to say, <laughs> I also agree uh, with, uh, with having a work session on this topic. I agree that we should have an update on this, and I agree that we should be working uh, to set broader values uh, and priorities towards prevention. Um, that is an enormous task, <laughs> and, and I understand that. Um, but it only comes uh, because of the, the excellence that has been shown to me for today. So um, I also want to thank you for that. So I wanted to kind of just uh, sum up what I'm hearing as far as next steps um, or direction from the council. Um, certainly it wasn't <laughs> all <laughs> clear. Uh, because there can be a lot of avenues that we can go towards. So um, I'll try to um, give my thoughts on what I kind of heard um, elevate. Um, so certainly we heard annual updates um, on the current document. Um, we heard uh, prevention focus is what we want the department and the staff to be really gearing in on are a lot of preventions, um, and that could even um, come with some, um, some opportunities for our social services to be a part of uh, maybe offering ways of how they can be a part of this. Uh, there may need to be some grant funding or something like that associated, but we did hear that. Um, we heard about the work session um, that we'll have just to talk about a different model. Um, for some um, calls that are more related to mental health calls, or we'll have to define what that actually looks like. But I, I feel strongly that the all the parties involved in and that response, the ambulance, the fire, um, fire department, police uh, department, should have conversations before that comes um, to us publicly. And then. Um, 
if this council wants to do some goals out in here um, that uh, we wanted to actually write out goals. I know that we have identified very clearly what some goals are. Um, you know, mental health is definitely a goal. Prevention is a goal. So I don't know if we want to wait to see if some of this, um, what we can get with the data, data analysis. Um, um, while there is clearly some um, some uh, things that the, everyone can be working towards, um, so goals, I think, maybe in the future um, as we identify some, although we have a lot already identified. So that's kind of what I gathered from this discussion. Certainly juveniles is, certain, um, is what we're seeing a lot of right now and not being addressed. Um, my thoughts is that there are community members out there, different um, groups that we can bring this to and say, hey, Let's sit in a room and let's talk about how can we um, kind of do that um, intervention uh, to change some of these behaviors. So that's my thought. And if we want to, um, I, I guess what I, I know that the community violence intervention program isn't that far, but I can certainly bring that up to them tomorrow mm -hmm. and just uh, maybe give a report back as to what their thoughts are or it, possible involvement. Can I, this is, I'm going to try and phrase it as a question because I know it's not on the agenda. For a future agenda item, there's been interest in setting new goals for the city manager, who is, in fact, um, oversees the chief of police. And I feel like at the same time, I think we've gotten a lot of meat to work with and a lot of suggestions. Um, because Jeff is ill right now, um, I feel that, sorry, just temporarily, um, I feel that um, we're kind of skipping. This is really the city managers to, to, to do this, and so maybe some of the things that we're thinking of goal-wise is really for a future session to have with the city manager about goal setting for him. Does that make sense? Because I feel like if for a second there was like, because I know that this, this document was actually written by the city manager, right? So at the same time, this is great feedback. I don't know that it's appropriate for us to give the chief of police sure. the goals. It's, it's not ours to do, right? So my question is, for a future work session, can we revisit the goals that uh, we talked about um, the need to set goals for the city manager since they haven't been set since 2016. Well, I'll, I'll answer it this way. You've certainly touched on uh, an important um, element of our charter, which is that council is to not direct uh, city staff who work underneath the city manager. But absolutely, you can provide those goals to the city manager, and then he'll, you know, as Councilor Progress has mentioned, kind of find a way to make it happen. Right. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Anything else? Thank you so much for being here. Thanks. All right, we're going to move on to item number three, clarification of agenda items. No recrusals. <laughs> okay. Item number four, information packet, June 8th. Information packet, June 15th. We've been talking about that. Yes, so, so we're going to move on to item number five, University of Iowa Student Government Updates, USG. Welcome. Good evening, counselors. <clears throat> Happy Pride, of course. It was great to see uh, some of the counselors out there. Uh, this Saturday. Um, get the elephant out of the room. I did dye my hair purple, so you're not. <laughs> I, I see it. We love it. Yeah. <laughs> oh. I know. <laughs> this uh, Father's Day with my friend. Um, just a heads up um, some of the times I will be late to work session, just coming late. I will be here for announcements and should be here on time. It's just that I work for Iowa Wildlife Camps, and we usually get done around hopefully before four, but it can run into four. 
Um, big USG updates, though. Uh, so I will be. Ha I have a new email, uh, usg-city-liaison at uiwa.edu. I'll be sending uh, my announcements there, so don't don't freak out too much if you can't remember it. Um, and then another big thing is that our WeScap we housing program through Iowa House Hotel has also just opened up its applications. Um, we've been sharing it on social media. I'm working on a way to get that shared out with uh, everyone to get that full, filled up. And it's still important that the renter's guide um, survey is still also going out. So we'll be sharing that as well. So that's really all that we have for USG. And thank you guys and have a good night. Thank you. All right. Item number six is the council updates on assigned boards, commissions, and committees. Um, I'm working with the outreach subcommittee for the city of literature um, to put together um, also a letter of support um, for the state of Illinois' ban on book bans. Um, and so as a city councilor, because I had also um, raised this up as a potential proclamation or, or letter of support, um, we'll be working sort of in coordination with um, different entities so that the, the our messaging is clear and consistent. So that will be meeting, we'll be meeting tomorrow. I think before our next council meeting, we'll have a Jack meeting. So uh, I'm sure we'll talk about some of the things we discussed this evening and get an update on 988. Mm -hmm. I know our next council meeting is gonna be the second Tuesday, July 11th um, next month. And then we will be having on the following Monday, the joint entities meeting. So we will probably want, we're gonna probably need to know this topic if soon, if there's I, a topic of I interest. I think there'll be plenty of time. I was gonna put a memo in the packet for the July meeting. Okay. Because typically we have to have it turned in by that Wednesday, so. So it'll be Tuesday and then Wednesday, <laughs> okay, before the meeting. Great. So be thinking about that. Oh, I, I think a while back I'd said that we'd had a pr presentation from Jack at one of our meetings about uh, the emergency notification system, and uh, so I think that'd be good to, to add on there. Mm -hmm. All right, any other updates? Hearing none, we are adjourned from work session and see you all back at 6 p.m. for our formal meeting. <laughs>